Coach Mickey, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. And this is your first time joining us. Come on in and make yourself comfortable. For those of you that join us on a regular basis, I am so glad that you do. And thank you so much for always reaching out to my guests. They love hearing from you. And I really appreciate all your comments, your questions, and your suggestions of some of the people to have on. Uh, it has been so much fun having a lot of you reach out to me through all my social media and letting me know how you have actually connected with a lot of my guests. And today is no different. Um, I met this guest. I was at an event in Atlantic City. And for many of you that have heard my other podcasts and know me personally, I was at a lot of a martial arts event and I was, this one is no different. However, going to these events is not only fun for me because I love seeing the talent and the people and the upcoming martial artists, but it is the people that I get to meet that have been trailblazers throughout the martial arts uh, that have made such a huge difference in the community with what they do and who they are. And uh, this, this martial artist, this person, this individual just stands out way above and beyond someone that I have had an opportunity and a pleasure to meet. And I am so excited. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because if I went through his whole bio, we would never get to the podcast with him. Uh, he has uh, been an advocate about bullying. He has been in the Air Force. He has been in theater. He has been um, works with G Deepak Chopra. He's been on the radio. He has just been a huge advocate. And I'm excited to have him. He is the founder of Harmony Power. Thank you for joining us, Sensei John Marion. How are you? Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you in Atlantic City. And then, of course, do this podcast with you. It's a, it's a great honor. So I'm going to let you jump right in with what you have done, because when I looked at your bio and how you've gotten started, and then you've taken this whole journey with what's happened to you, not only in your life, but what you've incorporated and how many people you have helped, uh, it is just it's amazing. It re I mean, and I, I don't use that word li lightly, but you really have done an incredible incredible amount of things that have helped so many people. Well, I'll tell you, there's, there's lots to share. And I'll just start with, as an open, I said, I'm the founder of Harmony Power. Like you said, Harmony Power Foundation. I'm the founder of Harmony by Karate as well. Harmony by Karate is a school that I have in Manhattan, the Upper West Side. I've had it for 30 years, full time, which, you know, in Manhattan, if you have anything for five years, you're, it's kind of like a big deal because it's a highly competitive environment but i've you know i've spent a lot of time learning how to compete with myself and the key is to work on yourself and this is what a lot of people don't realize and to, and to live in the best integrity that you know how and to teach that that's really what it's about and that's what keeps anything uh if you're trying to achieve something in the long term that's really the way to do it and to keep things simple you know we're not breaking boards and doing backflips and doing all the flashy stuff so i don't i don't market the the flash, I market simple things that anybody can learn how to do. It's like learning how to swim. You learn a few strokes and you spend your lifetime trying to make that better. So I, I take that approach, which I find to be, I, I think I'm unique that way. And I've had some amazing mentors. So I'll start with my childhood. I was bullied severely from the age of eight to the age of 17. Like, you know, basically anything you could think about, I experienced. And I don't, I, I was a victim then, but I'm not a victim of any of that now, just so that whoever's listening in, that's not how I view it. The trauma for me was my power. And every time I want to achieve something, I tap into the trauma. The trauma is a beautiful thing. It's not just like, oh, that happened to me, too. poor me. I don't know. To me, it's more about what do you do with it, right? So some people take the trauma and they want to go hurt people. Others want to help. I take it to the other. I want to just help. I want to do big things. But such incredible traumas happened to me that it's like, wow, I live to tell that story, right? Um, but the beginning of the trauma was actually being on the streets with my mother. Um, I spent a few years homeless with my mom. And she had her own struggles, which I keep that private because, I, you know, just to respect her. Uh, at least now, I, I just feel that it's enough to know that a three-year-old at the ages of three and six and a half, I was on the streets. And I didn't learn the alphabet until I was like six and a half because I was not getting schooled and we were in and out of homes. Like being homeless doesn't mean you're in a cardboard box. It means that you're not in a certain place for a long enough time to call it a home. 
or you're on a floor without furniture, right? And you're cold, or you're not eating, and you're you're excited because the food truck is outside. You're going to get a banana and some a container of milk, and that's your excitement. So these are, that's the kind of like life I had for a few years, and then I had weekends where my mother would drop me off with my uh, grandparent who married my grandmother. He was Puerto Rican, so I was kind of he was very nurturing, very loving, and it was kind of like a saving grace in that process. While my father was fighting to gain custody, and he would get me every couple of weeks, but it was kind of like it was that battle, and eventually he was able to get me, which resulted in other traumas of bullying, living in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, look, the first bullying incident happened when a boy took my head and slammed it into the curb so the blood come, came in uh, the back of my head. And my stepmother came out with a broomstick, just like out of a movie, but it's the truth. She came out screaming with a retiring woman, ah, crazy. And that was the beginning of my martial arts journey. My dad was already training with the Japanese who so came over from Japan. He was training with the best of the best at that time. And he was only a yellow belt, but he was a street fighter, was learning karate. And he's like, look, I'm going to put, I'm gonna get, we're going to make a heavy bag because we didn't have much money. And he kind of created, a can, took a canvas bag, stuffed whatever he could into the bag. And I was hitting that every day. And uh, I had a certain uh, ritual. He'd have me do push-ups and sit-ups and, and punching the bag, kicking. And that was my drill. And that same bully that hit my head in the curb, I had to deal with that same bully again. And he, he wanted to fight on glass. Eight years old, we're fighting on glass because he wanted to fight. I was like, okay. And I hit the bully as hard as I could, as fast as I could to the face. And I didn't stop. And he literally just fell on top of me because he just got hit so many times. And I thought he was going to beat me up. He just got up and walked away. And that was how I dealt with it. It was violence, met violence. Now, that's what worked then. I don't believe in that. Even though I went through that, that comes later in my story. So the bullying happened throughout the years. I, I was I dealt with some trauma where, uh, I, I'll give you another bullying, where I was 17 and somebody who was big enough, a wrestler who towered over me, would bully me, wrestle me to the ground. Uh, and I was doing martial arts. I was just so terrified of this large person subduing me and slapping me and calling me names and treating me terribly. So one day, you know, we're amongst peers and he's like, I want to fight you. You do crime, I'm going to fight you. I'm like, you, I'm thinking to myself, you fight me every day. Every day you take me to the ground and I'm, I'm like crying for help. But he wanted to make a public display of the fact that he's beating up a martial arts person. So my dad said, when they do that, he's wearing glasses. I see. He's tell him to take the glasses off. And now he's got one hand. So he took the glasses off and I hit him so hard and so fast as I could chasing down a hallway like a lunatic because I was so terrified of this person. Fell down a whole flight of stairs. That was the end of that bully. You know, so these are stories that I dealt with. Like I, you know, I've, I've been knocked out being bullied where you get hit in the body or like you're lifted and you're thrown into a wall and you black out. That happened to me twice, you know, in, in, in these fights. And well, fights where... You know, you're you know fighting someone, and they hit them so much that there's they're literally soaked in blood because they're so awful. And I had to hit them that much to get them down to the ground. And uh, you know, but that became the past. One day, people knew I wasn't going to take it, and I was I had that element of like standing up and being a little crazy to meet the crazy. Um, people started being nice, and then I got involved in dancing, which. I wanted to learn and I was terrible at it. Like I, I had no rhythm. I was like that stereotype. Well, here's another white guy trying to dance. Like that stereotype that people talk about. Yeah, I was that guy. I couldn't hear the beat. I don't know what I was doing. But when I watched my Filipino friend jump up in the air and drop into a split and spin around and pop lock dance and the girls were screaming, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be him. I just didn't know how I was going to get there. So I was watching every type of, I was watching Star Search and Dance Fever, all those shows are on back then, just imitating what I could see. Learned a little from a little bit from that guy. All of a sudden, I started to put moves together because I would use my martial arts with that, kicking and that kind of fun stuff. So I ended up going to a nightclub in the city and I started picking up moves there. And I was like the only uh, person with light skin walking into this place where there's Hispanic and African-Americans just dancing. There's a way Madonna was discovered called the Fun House. 
And I had fun in the fun house and then created an act, went to Vegas to visit my mom, who you know, we had rekindled ties. She over the years she stayed in touch, she sent me gifts, and I would see her like once or twice a year. But then I was getting old enough to get on a plane to go see her. And I showed her this dance act that I have. And she says, We got to get you in a competition. I said, Where's all there's a top one in Vegas? So I want to put you in that competition. So I went with her brother to this competition, stuck me into a club, underaged, and I took second place in the in the in the, in the whole city in this big competition. And I realized that I had something special. And I continued to cultivate that, entering talent shows and doing things of that nature. But I was a Bob Hope fan. I loved Elvis Presley, and they were military entertainers. And I said, I want to do that. I want to, I want to join the military, become an Air Force entertainer. And I'd gotten so good at it. And uh, so when I went into my recruiter, I said, uh, I want to sign up because I want to become an Air Force entertainer. He looked at me. He goes, You want to be an entertainer? Are you kidding me? Like, then he stopped. He goes, Well, we have it, but like, you have to be like, you know. It's like the special forces of entertainment. You have to be like spectacular. Otherwise, there's just no, I don't know how good you are, but understand that you, you've got to win multiple levels of competition to go on a tour around the country. I said, oh, I'm going to do that. I said, can a wizard pay want to sign up? Literally, I signed up because with an intention. I didn't care what job I took. I wasn't even thinking about that. I'm like, I'm going to be that guy traveling the country. And uh, so I get in there. And uh, I'm in basic training. And the drill sergeant, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm staying at attention. The drill sergeant comes up to me. He goes, uh, Airman, he goes, what job are you here for? I said, sir, I want to be an Air Force entertainer, sir. Now, this is an African-American in the South. He was mad. He's like, get in my office. He starts screaming at me in the office. He said, you're going to, I'm giving you an order to dance right now. 3 o'clock in the morning, just him and I. He brings a boom box, puts it on his desk, hits the button. I jump in the air, I spin around, dropping a split, doing spinning kicks, doing a flip, whatever things I was, I was just, he's like, flicks the bunny, he goes, well, all right. He said, what you got to do, you want to be, he goes, you're going to have to win at base level, then command level, and you're going to go to worldwide. You got to win all these competitions. You got to win first place. They don't take second place winners. And it's a worldwide competition, but you have to enter that to even have that opportunity. I said, yes, sir. He says, get back on your, get back in the, uh, do, to your duties. The next day, he comes out with the boombox route. It's in Texas, San Antonio. Hot as can be. We're all standing at attention for like, I don't know, for hours, just stand there sweating. He comes out with the boombox, puts it on the ground, calls my name to come front and center to dance for the troops out of nowhere. No warm up, no preparation. Yes, sir. I get out there, do the dance, and they're, all the soldiers can't. They're not supposed to laugh, otherwise they get screamed at. So they were trying not to laugh to hold in their breath. And I'm just pop locking, doing all this crazy stuff. And then he's like, tells me, yells to stop, and get back in line. And that was the beginning. Then, about a week later, we're in basic training, and I'm on a bus. This is where I was kind of like a kind of a rule but a rule break a rule breaker when it came for the right reasons, right? So I see a sign. It said breakdance competition on the same base, Lackland Air Force Base. Now you have a side that's active duty, they're not basic training, and then you have the side who is getting the training. I was on the basic training side, you had a shave, bald, and so I I'm on the bus and I look at the sign on the other side. I said to the guy next to me, I said, I, I'm gonna go compete there. He said, what are you talking about? We're in basic training. Is you're gonna you're gonna get locked up, you're gonna be peeling potatoes. It's you know, you're gonna be in prison. I said, I'm gonna go over there. I said, listen, I said, during our break time, the competition is the exact time of our break. We have a 5 p.m. break, they let us out to go outside. I'm gonna run across the base, compete, and come back. He said, You're crazy. I said, It's okay, you don't have to come. I said, I'm gonna go. So I <laughs> I leave and he comes with me. I turn around and he's where are you going? He says, I'm coming with this. Where are you coming with me? So you go across the base. I get there and the competition already started. Put my name in and they're spinning on their heads and they're doing all this crazy stuff. So I end up getting out there. I win first place and then I run back to the other side. Never got caught, never got in trouble. And that was what happened. Yeah. 
I love it. It was really, it was extraordinary. And it happened just like the, exactly what I'm telling the story is exactly how I lived it out. So I get back. I went, to, I went base level competition. I got letters from generals, commanders. I had like a fan following of, of people who ran the, the, they ran the base. The high ranks would follow me around wherever I would perform. We had to go watch John and they would follow me. And then I ended up moving, going to uh, Louisiana, Barksdale, Louisiana, and I competed there one first place. I beat out this, these, this ballet dancer and this Michael Jackson Im, uh, imitator. They were terrific, but I was better, you know, and, and I was able to move forward. Then I ended up on a, a, uh, a national tour um, and I went to maybe maybe about 13 states and they like roll out the red carpet and you're just performing for families or you're performing for uh, generals and colonels. And it was just like a, so you're a celebrity. They, people give them autographs and that that was it was just great fun to do that. And we had to learn. We had to go through three days of training for it where you had another drill sergeant, a woman, who would come in and scream at you for three days. You weren't allowed to sleep, drink coffee, soda in the middle of the night, and to stay awake. And uh, that was the training to get on that tour, that amazing tour, uh, and have that experience. So I get out of the um, – well, before I got out of the Air Force, I saw this show called Showtime at the Apollo with Sinbad. And I told my friends, I said, I want to go on that show. And he said, they, my African-American friend said, there's no way they're going to let you in there. You won't even get on the stage. So what are you talking about? He said, they're going to hate you just because you're white. He said, you won't even get that chance. I said, I said, no, I'm going to go there. So I, I drove from uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire to Harlem in New York City. And I went to the Black Music Theater. And I got on this line to go into the theater. And sure enough, they wouldn't let me in. People kept cutting me. So I realized I wasn't in a safe situation. It was getting dark out. So I took my radio, my boombox, got in my car, drove back to the military base six hours. And they said, see, we told you. Why did you do that? That was that was I so I got to see my family because my family was in New York. So I got to see my family in that, that trip. But I was mad. And I was mad for a full year. I was just couldn't as I got out of the military and they advised, I said the the advisor said, I said, look, should I stay in the military or should I get out? And he said, if I had your dance shoes, I'd get out. He said, John, you're good. Get out. Went back to the Apollo and they lined. They did the same thing again, except this time I took my boom box and I cut the line. I went right to the front. I put it down, risked my life. They're all looking at me. Everybody's angry. I thought I, gonna, I, thought I was going to get out. But I got out of there alive. And I put it down and the head of this event was called Ralph. His name was Ralph Cooper Sr. He was the founder of Amateur Night at the Apollo. He says, who are you? And I said, John Mirion. Why are you here? I said, I came here to dance. And he said, get it over with. So I click the button and I get up and I'm doing my whole thing. And, I'm, you know, and they're starting to stand up. The crowd in the room starts to stand up and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're loving it. And then the music stops and everyone's saying, go, go, go. They want me to keep dancing. There's no music. And they're just clapping just to see me move. So Ralph Cooper Sr. said, sit down. So I sat down and he said, you're going to go on Showtime at the Apollo. So I went on. When I went on Showtime at the Apollo, the first round, I get on the stage, had my radio, walking across the stage. And they're going crazy, loving the footwork. As soon as I turn toward the audience, they see my other face. And, oh, what's he doing on stage? Right. <laughs> and then they start booing and cheering, booing and cheering. And then Sandman comes in, pulls me off the stage. That was I got pulled off for the first time. Well, some time passed. I, you know, I moved to New Jersey and I kept training. I was going to go back to the Apollo again. That was my mission to, to go in there. Went, auditioned again. And uh I got on the stage. When I got on the stage this time, it, I they started the music before I got on stage, almost like to to hurt my act. But what I did was I did spinning kicks like like a helicopter across the stage. I did one, two, three, four, and they turned around, dropped into a split, and I stood up and I looked at them. And they went, whoa, and they just stood up. 
And then I started moving my hips and the woman is screaming and then the men are going crazy and everybody's just like. And then I walked off the stage. I didn't finish the act. I literally stopped what I was doing. I walked off and I was I was in tears. And the producer comes over. He said, why are you leave? He was the producer. He said, why did you walk off? I says, because they love me. I did it. He said, we're going to put you on Showtime at the Apollo, which was a televised event was seen all over the world. So then I came, when I did Showtime, I went out there. And this time I did the act and it was just booze and cheers. And it was like a struggle with the crowd doing the, the same act, but it was just, they just struggled with me. And then I went on, I came a fourth time a year later, I created an act where I was glowing in the dark because I was the uh, dancer, I was the choreographer and dancer for Club MTV with Downtown Julie Brown. I did 72 episodes I auditioned for that at the same time as I'm going back to the Apollo for the fourth time. Uh, so this act called Neon City, where you see New York City in the background, all glowing in the dark. I come out there with this baseball cap and this fluorescent outfit. That's in a time where neon became the colors. I was the guy that brought that to MTV, the colors, and then all of a sudden it was all over the world. And uh, But I, the Apollo went crazy. And at the very end, the house lights went on. Then they saw I wasn't. They saw my color of skin. They were like booing and cheering again, but I still did it. And I and I still proved that there are those who love me and didn't care. And there's those that have still have those issues. But it was a beautiful experience because it led to Harmony Power later on where, you know, I and also my martial arts career. I um, I there was I was teaching while I was dancing. I was te teaching martial arts on the side, private lessons. I was teaching for Capitol Records in Manhattan. I was I had schools like these little satellites I was teaching in. I brought martial arts to the vertical clubs, all the vertical clubs in New York. I was the first to pioneer that. I was lucky to work with all these celebrities that were in a place called uh, the, it was a vertical club on the east side. And uh, it was an incredible that was all happening at the same time. I was I was doing this whole dance excursion and, and being adventurous. And then I was competing in martial arts as well and winning lots of competitions, mostly in forms. I was a forms competitor, and I've gotten as far as winning second place worldwide in fighting. I, we had no weight divisions. It was full contact. So I was a second place fighter without a weight class. And that was good enough for me. You know, I still have my body at 59. I, well, my, I haven't replaced anything yet. I feel great. Um but my other accolade that I'm known for is Reebok. I was a, a Reebok uh, gym, Reebok Sports Club gym was a famous gym in New York that opened up and they were looking for one athlete worldwide. And they interviewed the gold medalist, they interviewed everyone they could find. They wanted one teacher and it was a leadership driven program. They wanted somebody who was going to teach the leaders of New York City and the celebrities. And I was the first interview and interviewed 200 to um get that one deal, that one contract. And after the fifth year, they gave me two locations and I became a partner um, with that gym. Uh, and then I consolidated back to the one location and I stayed for 20 years in total full time with my dojo. They uh, closed shop and then I moved to 81st and Broadway where I'm at now almost 10 years. So I've had a long stretch in Manhattan with that and you know it's been a remarkable career and uh, so with all of that success and seeing the the bullying uh, crisis in America while I was doing my martial arts while I was doing my dance it was it was hard for me to to know my success and and the joy that I had and see what was going on in the country every time I'd watch something it would trigger a trauma for me and say I'm like I can't watch this and do nothing so I, I hired a publicist and I traveled the United States out of my own pocket into the worst neighborhoods, going into the schools to see what was going on. And it was it was extraordinary because I've learned that the system was set up where when kids would do something wrong, they were suspended, they were expelled, they went to jail. That seemed to be what they do in most systems. They had very few things in place to recognize children for the good they did. You know, like me, when I achieved in my past, like with dancing and martial, all those achievements built my character. That was my way out of the bully, my way to stand up for myself, my way to, to love myself. And they knew that they needed something like what I experienced 
and have the opportunity in the schools because the schools were not giving that. Only a few for the academics would get rewards or those athletes. Those in the middle just, you know, kind of left out. And, you know, I went, was, I started the campaign in 2010. And that led to getting a lot of media attention again on all the networks throughout the country. As you mentioned before, I did the show with Deepak Chopra on bullying. His brother was there, Sanjeev, who was, was the head dean for Harvard Medical School. He immediately joined my board of directors for my charity, uh, for Harmony Power. In fact, uh, Harmony Power was set up by AIG and Verizon uh, because they were representing some of those corporations that saw this as a real solution. Not a viable one, but like a real solution, because when you're recognizing children for the good they're doing through their gifts and passions, and you're doing it in mass volume, that's what changes the world. In one particular city in New Jersey, Elizabeth, not only adopted Harmony Power, they made it a mandate for the whole city, 28,000 children, where one out of three get the award for doing good. So when I go into these in these events, it's like it's like watching a concert. It's like um, I walk in, it's happening. And then I might be the added bonus where they ask me to tell the speech or something or they want to see me perform. They want to and I get them all riled up and excited. But literally, if there's a one hour event, I'm five minutes. And that's what happened. Uh, whereas I was in Brooklyn recently, I, I, I also have a contract now with New York City Public Schools I'm actually the leadership resource for anti-bullying for all the schools in, in, in the five boroughs. That that took me six years to get that contract. And so I went to, I did two assemblies. I was the show. I had to like, because you have to stop the ground up again. But they recognized, uh, maybe they recognized 15% of their population instead of one third, which I was thrilled with. And they got the Harmony Power Awards. And, but I did wanted more of my talk, my history and and. They wanted to see some video clips. And then at the end, the kids pushed me to still show my dance. And I'm like, ah, I don't really do that. But yeah, I do a little bit, you know, but I practice every week. And they went crazy. These kids went from like, this is inner city middle schoolers. They went from like, when is this guy going to stop talking? You know, even though they like some of the things I was saying, we want to see him dance. And they all like the Apollo. The kids went crazy, you know, and, and it was just I was excited. I'm like, wow. I was, I was saying to my wife, I, said, I can't believe that I could still get inner city kids that are middle schools on their feet. Like they're so critical. Like you have to be really good to, to capture them. And they not only did I capture them, but they come up wanting my autograph, wanting to shake my head, wanting to take a picture because I know in a, in a small way I touched their heart. Because when they see that I'm that guy. It's not just a history. I'm in the now, living it, doing it, showing them what's possible with their bodies and their mind and their spirit. That's why Harmony Power is this is the real solution to bullying, the bullying crisis as we see it. You know, when you see mass shootings, it's these kids that are left out, that grow up, and they're angry because nobody paid attention. And in their mind, no, you didn't pay attention to me. I don't exist. Why should you? That's their mindset. So it doesn't take a crazy person. It takes a person who's left out to a point where their their life doesn't matter anymore. And this is why I feel that it's critical that the leadership of the school systems pay very close attention and that they adopt this as their way. Not because it's my way. It's not my way. The kids own it. The kids want it and give the kids what they want. They want it. They want. Look, the system is like they have 33 days to change the world. And kids are doing things that they want to do. And they're getting a Harmony Power Award on the 33rd day, Universal Harmony Day, for what they do, right? Because it's their thing. They own it. It's not about me or, or the system. It's their system. And when they own it, they love it. And they feel valued and they believe in themselves. And therefore, they're a whole lot less chance to be a victim, a whole lot less chance to be a bully. Because if that's the new culture, the new way of of Working with the youth, we have a great future in front of us. So tell me and what the program involves. Because working with the kids, you're saying that they're doing it their way. So like when you go in and work with the, you know, with these schools, what do these programs actually incorporate? Because so they can actually either get these awards, but also it's making this huge change in these kids' lives. 
Well, I mean, they're doing what I do. They get on stage, except they're singing, they're dancing, they have artwork plastered across the walls with peace, love, kindness, respect. Um, they're expressing who they are. They're they're doing rap music. They're doing poetry. There's no end to what they can do to express. It's the way they express to each other, but they're doing it in a positive way, and they're sharing it to each other. That's right. And being recognized for coming out of their shell and being who they are. Some express pain. They come up there, and they're angry about the world, and they're expressing it because no one listened, but now everybody's listening. So, therefore, they're more likely to be positive in the long run. And the grades go up because now they're they love school. They love being in school because now they matter. People are paying attention to them. So it's a win-win situation. Anyone who doesn't do it is foolish. Truly. If they don't adopt the system, look, you quote what you want. Hard power is a nice name. And uh, you know, I I can roll this out in an hour or two with any city because I've, you know, I've got it down pat. I just overcome stupid objections. Like people say, well, I understand why we have to recognize the children. We already have this program. And I said, no, are you recognizing the 70% that are being ignored? Probably not. That's the issue. So it's more about convincing the, the administration. There's a lot of great teachers and great people out there doing great things. But if it was so great, we wouldn't have kids out there torturing each other, hurting themselves and each other the way that we do more than we've ever seen. So if they're hurting each other in the masses and they're shooting each other, they're doing, we have to do something that is recognizing the masses in a very profound way every year. You have to give them a month out of that school year, like launch into the year that way. And you watch the difference throughout the year. It's like they I, look, I had somebody come over my house to replace my washer and dryer. This is about three weeks ago. I said, where do you live? He said, Elizabeth, New Jersey. He said, oh, yes, yeah. is my program is mandated in that city. What is that? He said, I said, how many power? He stopped. He goes, wait a second. He said, my daughter has your certificate on my refrigerator. It's been up there for months. It's been up there for months. What does that, what does that piece of paper mean to that child? Makes a difference. Makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's a huge difference, right? There, these, these are the most sensitive years to a child. So any recognition that says that they matter, they exist, they're good at something. If they're just kind to people to get an award, there's something good in everyone. There's something good in the worst of children. Look, I went to Chicago when I was on my tour, right? So I, I got put in a room with, with the most challenging kids, but the ones that they call bullies. Of course, I had to get tough with them because I don't, you know, I think I can't go in there with fear and had them all be quiet, sit down and be, and just listen. Then I got to know each name. Then I had these kids come help me. And I said, look, there's a big reward if you help me. They set up a stage. They followed me. So the reward was they gave them the whole front row of the, the assembly. They When they saw what I did for that assembly and they had, you know, the, the media showed up, it was a like big to do. And I gave them attention. They wouldn't leave. Everyone left. These kids stayed. I said, why are you guys not leaving? They said, we just love hearing you talk. We, they don't want to go. That's because you make them feel important. You know, and that's what every kid wants. Uh, you know, regardless of age or or whatever their background is, you know, like you said, they want to feel like they make a difference, like they're significant. And, and your program brings that to the table. And I, I wish I could take the clone you and just drop you all over the world because there, it's needed so badly. And you and I talked off air uh, a couple days ago when we were, when we were collaborating to do the podcast. And I said, it is such uh, a huge responsibility as, and, you know, as, as a parent, but also as a teacher, as a coach. Anybody that works with kids, they're completely missing it knowing that making a difference in a child's life is a huge responsibility and recognizing every single one of them and, and not just, like you said, the chosen few that may be, you know, good at something or, or you know, doing something on their own. It's the ones that need to, to you to take them under their wing and, and let them know that they matter. And I love that you take your program and you utilize this and you're teaching this, you know, in places that really need it the most. We need it everywhere, even in the richest communities where I know of a city in New Jersey, they put swastikas up everywhere attacking Jews. You know, they're attacking races of people because kids don't feel the love in themselves. This is why they're doing that. They're looking for attention again. 
It's negative attention. You know, I'll tell you this other story. You know, I get choked up when I, when I, 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 I have so many stories in my head. There was a picture sent to me and the boy was hugging the teacher and he was crying. And why was he crying? Because he got the Harmony Power Award. Why did he get the Harmony Power Award? Because his behavior got better in school. So they recognized that. Imagine this child who is a troublemaker. He starts fights. He's violent. Got better. And he got re- he's crying. So we have to stop pointing the finger at money. I'm sick of, I'm tired of hearing about money as an excuse. I'm tired of people pointing at my, the administrators. You could, they could do right in their classroom. What principal is going to say, I don't want you to give awards out for kids that are behaving well. Make up your own piece of paper. Don't tell me that that's against anybody's rules, that you need an approval to recognize the good in a child. I'm just saying if you if you give them something to do within the classroom activities that's positive, maybe it's stuff they're already doing, and you you give them a month of focus where they're interacting about it in some small way, when you pay attention to it, it it's a big thing to them. You just said, here's a piece of paper. They're not going to feel anything. But if you give them something to focus on just a little bit each day or each week, and then at the end of the month, it's it's about how it's presented. And the love that you're expressing to them is the love they're going to feel about who they are. I think it also teaches other kids, too, the ones that are always the, you know, the superstars or they excel at everything. But to see somebody else get recognized for something that is so important that it's not always what you do that's, you know, to excel at, but it's also to do to be kind and and recognize other people that may not have those skills. You know, I'm I'm looking at it from an athletic point of view because I've worked, you know, as you know, I I do football and I see the superstars that come through. But then my heart has always been with the kids that didn't work the starters, that weren't the first, first stringers, because they were there to practice every single day. They were giving 110%. Just because they didn't excel, they didn't, it didn't minimize who they were or what their abilities or what their value was part of that team. It's no different than in school. It's like who they are as a person, everybody's got value. Everybody's unique. I always tell them, I said, you know, be yourself because everybody else is taken. You know, you just, if you are unique and you have a unique talent, you just have to let it just shine through you. And and I can see through through your harmony, you give that ability to, for everybody in every place, in every situation to be able to be recognized, you know, above and beyond, you know, when, to see what their true values are to shine through. You know, and here's the, here's the thing with it, I have to teach children, which is most important, and this is for adults, too. Look, I'm good at what I do. There's so much better than me. It's it, There's no end to what's better than me. I watch what these kids are doing today. It's, I'm a joke. But kids are blown away when they see me because I'm so loving and passionate about it. And I'm good enough for them to understand that I can do it. And it's about me doing it that makes them feel connected. Not that I'm so great that they haven't seen. No, not at all. I'll, I'll be 59 years old. I'm not doing front flips anymore. There's certain things that I have to draw lines on. But I'm, the, I, the love that I have for, for me doing what I do is just that's it. So it doesn't matter what the child does or what the picture they draw looks like or, or the song they're singing or rapping, whatever it might be. It's that expression of them being who they want to be. Look, in this life, I tell even when I teach my martial arts, doing what you love to do with those you love to do it with. It's all about that, you know, and with, yeah, and we know to be kind and respectful, but you need respect first to respect what we don't understand. And then kindness is an act of love, showing levels of kindness. If we have the two, we have everything. We have to have that for ourselves first. And that, that's why harmony power is so important. We have to be respectful to who we are, kind to ourselves before we can express it elsewhere. So the, a lot of the anti I believe programs are very, um, they're very reactive. This happens to you, do this, this, and that. Be kind, be respectful. But if you don't have the self part, you're just 
going to fake it. Even though faking it, you can fake it till you make it, that, that can make you feel good too. But to really do the inner work is to teach somebody to be you. You be you. Because nobody can do that but you. And that's the big nucleus, the big missing piece in the anti-bullying crisis that we're in. Well, the bullying crisis, I should say. That's what's missing in the mass shootings. They've got more reactive measures, more like gun control laws. Look, I'm a military person. I don't think somebody should have a military weapon in your hand ever. You're going to be in the military and you should have a background check. I believe in the basics of that, yes. But the the cause of a child looking for something to hurt people, that needs to be dealt with more so than anything else. And that's why Harmony Power is, it's the real solution. It's that idea. Think about it. We're doing it in the homes, right? So we don't hit our kids or we've all crossed lines where people are hitting their kids, screaming at them, whatever they're doing, which is terrible, right? It's we People cross those lines. I grew up that way. Italian household, that, that was like, you didn't just hit your kid. You bragged about it. Kids and children were seen, not heard. That's the culture we come from. Now it's like you sit and have a conversation. You actually listen. I spent a lot of time listening more than I've ever done. And that's what the new generation wants. They want to be heard, not be people, you know, doling out all this fear and intimidation. That old school leadership doesn't work. But look at it in our politics, right? Look at who's trying to, like, forget about what political party you're in. If people are using fear and intimidation or putting down other people, other leaders as a way to get ahead, we know is is not good. You can't trust people who do that if that's their methodology. And if you're if you're doing that with your children as parents using fear and intimidation, it doesn't work. They go to school and those kids do fear and intimidation, become bullies. So we can't have bullying leaders in the home, in the schools, in, in our society, and then the corporate world, the the, the corporate bullying is a whole other craziness that People go to work and they're miserable going to work because the way that's that old paradigm that is struggling to be phased out on a worldwide scale, not just our society. I mean, I'm thinking poverty power needs to be over the world. That that I, I know just from, from bullying that is a crisis everywhere right now. It's not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's actually worse in other places. Like go to Japan, it's worse because these are kids that are, you know, they're just struggling to express who they are, let alone, you know, being their passion and get awarded for it. Like, that's just not even, you know, it's a lot of emotional suppression. Yeah, and and it's, it's unfortunate, as you said, like there's there's things that are happening worldwide. Um, I I could spend hours with you because you are so insightful and you've got so much um, positive things to share. Uh, so I've got to have you back on. So we have got, we can go on and do some more because I really know that you've got so much more valuable information. Uh, but up until then, how can uh, they reach you? And as everybody knows, the information will be down in the description so you can reach out to Sensei John, but also um, it'll be embedded into the podcast if you're listening on uh, any of the platforms that this is going to be on. But just give a shout out real quick. So where where can they find you? You know, just so if they can hear it within the podcast. Well, for the charities, HarmonyPowerNow.org. So I welcome people to reach out to me. Let's bring it to your city in a big way. That's a given. You want to change the world? Contact me. We'll do it together. Number one. Number two, HarmonyByKarate.com. That's my core base in Manhattan. If you, you want to contact me that way, that's a possibility as well. And uh, But I want to thank you for being on this wonderful podcast. Well, I thank you for, for being here. And I, it has been it has been such a seriously such a gift to have you on and and share your information and your story and and what you're doing is just I don't know there, there's no words to put on I think it's just a feeling you know and, and when you come across or you meet somebody like you you know it, this this information needs to be shared you know not just where you are locally but I think globally and uh, I definitely would like to have you back and, and share some more information. But um, thank you so much. I love what you're doing. You are an amazing person. And uh, yeah, let's let's come back. I want you to come back. <laughs> I appreciate it. It was a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Thank you so All right. much. I will see you soon. Hey, guys. Yeah. So again, please reach out to Sensei John. I, I really feel as though if you have got 
a connection or somebody you know, and I'm, I know many of you listen that have got kids in school, you know, or any other programs, this could be something amazing to incorporate where you're at. You know, even if it's just to reach out to, to Sensei John and say, hey, how can I do this? And I think this is something that really needs to be done especially with our youth and our and the programs that are happening now. And why not just fit one more program into to what's happening that can do really, really good. Uh, until then, remember, um, the most courageous thing you can do is be yourself. And I will look forward to seeing you. Until then, see ya. This episode was brought to you by KeepOnSharing.com. They're calling themselves the first truly ethical social network. They'll share back 50% of their revenue with their users, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's free to register, and they never sell your information. You can list your products, events, and content for free. Adult content accounts, be gone. They're fun, positive, and encouraging sites supporting local business. In a day and age where social media sites, even well-established ones, are being brought to light left and right for their questionable and sometimes downright archaic business practices, KeepOnSharing.com is a well-needed breath of fresh air. While you can share personal content, news articles, or just about anything for fun and profit, the marketplace allows practically anyone to sell anything at any time from anywhere. But on this site, you are the boss. I cannot express how amazing it is that KeepOnSharing.com shares 50% of all revenue back with the users on top of having a truly transparent, supportive, and clean business model. Check them out. I'm signing up. Will you? Go ahead and meet me on there. Just go to KeepOnSharing.com. A link will be provided in this episode's description. 